Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a ton for uh, PJ for inviting us out and uh, you know the whole laundry team for putting this together. Really appreciate it. But uh, hey, I'm Nick Scarcella. I am a senior designer over at Future Deluxe. And tonight I'll be breaking down some scenes from our Sonos Dune film. There will be a lot of Dune references. So apologies if you haven't seen the movies. Also, what are you doing? Uh, okay. So before we get into the project, I'd like to talk a little bit about our roles at FD. Um, you know, even though our roles are different on paper, we're all really just generalists at heart. Um, I'm just scrolling through work here. But, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter what tool or idea it is. Uh, whatever is interesting enough to explore is what we're going to gravitate towards every time. Uh, you know, motion design itself is such a broad field. Yeah, I still have such a hard time explaining to anyone what I actually do. So a couple weeks ago, me and Steven, another artist at FD, went over to USC to do portfolio reviews for their master's students. And uh, hey, that's you. <laughs> well, all of the work we saw was incredible, by the way. But uh, one common thing that we saw amongst some of the candidates that we talked to were, uh, you know, people thought that they didn't really fit into a role because they had too many interests. Um, you know, these people were coming from backgrounds in architecture, industrial design, fine art, cinematography, and everything sounded incredible to us, uh, but many people said that they, they wanted to explore everything, but were told to pick a lane and start to specialize more. Heard that. Uh, you know, that's really not the case in our studio and most 3D studios in the area and like in our little sphere. Uh, you know, it's not really what we're about. We really embrace this generalist mentality of explore anything, do anything you want. Um, you know, I think there may be a little bit of a misconception about what it takes to be a generalist. They need to be an expert at everything. Um, and that sometimes this can feel like the expectation. You know, but it's really like a creative process and solving problems with whatever the tools is that you have at your disposal and even suggesting new ones is part of the job too. And uh, taking chances with uh, a bunch of different kinds of software. So we like exploring every tool that we have available to us. It really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you know, there's clearly a lot of crossover between our roles as we'll get into later. Uh, it's not about being an expert, it's more about knowing what's out there um, and being able to explore creatively wherever that might lead. Uh, being a generalist means that you can have as much agency as you want throughout any part of the process. Um, that's something that we really take pride in at FD specifically. You know, if you limit yourself too early and don't put your hand in this box and explore, uh, you won't end up here. And it's pretty dark, but... Yeah. <laughs> so, with that spiel out of the way, let's get into the project. Um, I want to talk you through some scenes that I actually contributed. Man, that's dark. Uh, yeah, and so we're all on the same page. Let's just go ahead and check out the spot. So I joined this process, or I joined this project at the end of the uh, design phase, um, meaning the team had done a lot of R&D, and I was asked to kind of take all these different pieces and start to turn it into a film. Uh, whenever I join in this kind of capacity, I usually have three questions for the director, CD, whoever I'm reporting to. Uh, where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going? 
Uh, so where have we been? Here's uh, what the team came up with for design. Uh, this, these were done by uh, Martin, somewhere out there, and uh, Brian, our uh, CD at the time. Uh, you know, the idea of this spot was uh, that the product, the speaker, was so immersive and the surround sound so enveloping that it invited the content into the room with you. And so we wanted to have this living room that eventually turns into Arrakis itself. Here's some more design, just figuring out some of the props and getting some other Sonos product in there. Um, they're taking some of the architecture and inspiration from the films and uh, you know, incorporating it into the design and starting to bring in some of those elements from uh, the exterior inside the room to see how that would work. Then we had two freelancers join, uh, Daniil and Ewan, who were uh, going to do some sand sims for us in Houdini. They did an incredible job and made so much work. Uh, here's some dev of the explosion moment, which we'll get into later. Some more dev. We could go on all night with how much dev there is, honestly. Uh, Ewan went kind of bananas with uh, these Claudney moments, which are these patterns that happen when you pour grains onto a metal plate and then run vibrations through them. They start to coalesce into these very organic patterns. There's just so much more. Uh, you know, and with all this development up front, uh, now we have plenty of... Uh, whoop. <laughs> We have uh, plenty of uh, assets to make a film with here. So my first day on the project, um, I made all these cameras, but everyone else was uh, kind of weaned off onto other projects except for Bryant. And uh, we worked together to craft this film. I would essentially handle the 3D and comp while Bryant kept the edit and the supers together. Um, so I made all these cameras. There's about 30 more that I couldn't fit onto the slide. Um, but we took all that, plus the development that Ewan and Daniil did, and just crafted an edit that we were happy with, with maybe the first one or two days. Uh, with all that work done up front, this came together really quickly and didn't change much from, uh, you know, the final film that we saw earlier. So let's get into this shot. So... One of the harder things about being a generalist is getting all these tools to play nicely together, as we've all experienced, I'm sure. Uh, you know, I knew that I wanted to render this out of Houdini because of all the sand sims and how heavy they were. And um, I also didn't want to touch what Bryant did in this living room because it looked so nice. So I've tried this before, but I thought maybe it could work here where I exported the entire scene as one Redshift proxy with all the lighting and everything and just try to one-shot it. And surprisingly, it worked perfect. Um, this is just the entire Houdini scene. <laughs> um, and so working this way, we had one master proxy which would get updated if the room ever needed changes. And that just fed into all the scenes since they were referencing the same file. Um, so I could make a change in cinema, move the lamp around, change the color of the, uh, the desk, whatever it is, and then just re-cue the Houdini scenes on deadline without ever needing to open them once. Um, it was a really efficient workflow and saved a ton of time, especially since I was the only one on production here. I didn't have to go back and forth into 100 scenes to make you know, these changes. It was, it was just really efficient that way. So once I started to get things together into the same software and could actually start crafting a look, um, we took a step back and decided what are the elements that we need to incorporate into these shots just besides laying everything on top of each other. So looking at the film, two things that stood out immediately to me that I wanted to get in there as far as like the feeling goes is getting the feeling of heat from you know, the, all these sands and Arrakis and how hot it is and the bokeh effects that you get when you actually start to see spice in the air. Um, it's a central point to the film, and I wanted to make sure that that was intact, or at least represented in ours. So for this explosion shot, um, 
there's this shockwave effect that precedes the explosion, and uh, it's really just a radial mask blurred out and some distortion with uh, chromatic aberration. This is kind of the oldest trick in the book as far as comp goes, but it really just gave the shot the extra pizzazz it needed. And um, I've gotten all kinds of questions about that effect specifically, like is there glass in front of the lens or whatever, like it's really that simple, uh, a little disappointing maybe. <laughs> but um, you know, these little tricks and just this slight adjustment can elevate a shot beyond putting a camera in a scene and rendering it and just take it that extra like 5% over the, you know, over the bar. So then the vortex shot. After all that development that Ewan did, we finally landed on this one that's playing on my machine, but not there. It looks like that. Uh, these are all the final render passes that I had at the end. And uh, this shot took ages to render on the farm. We had to do these 4K squares to get in all our crops. And so I knew that I didn't want to re-render this you know, 100 times to try and dial in this look. So with these compasses, I'm able to craft a look in comp way faster than I would have even in CG with all the render power that I could want. I want to talk about this pass specifically because I figured it out on this one, and then this pass is in almost every other shot that has sand. Um, this is all done post-sim, uh, and let me walk you through a mock setup of how to set something like this up. So this isn't the shot from the film, but a much sim more simplistic version where I'm just setting up a vellum grains, and then I'm applying a rest attribute before the sim, which is just storing the positions of all these points before they start moving around. And then I can reference them back later. Um, to create a volume field similar to Ewan's, I'm, I'm using a velocity field, um, like a volume, just so I can visualize it a little bit easier. I like that instead of trying to guess what the pop force is. Um, I can just see what I'm doing a little bit easier. And then once I catch up, I feed that into vellum, and then that will cache. And now we're moving. So once I start uh, tumbling around the viewport, uh, we'll eventually want to add some color to this or like start to apply some of those same attributes. But if we just apply a, a color, it's gonna reference wherever the points are as they're moving, like nothing's sticking to the sim. And then eventually we will use the rest attribute that we set before the sim to start to uh, get things to stick to the points later. Just applying the rest attribute inside of the location. So now everything's sticking to our particles and we can start to manipulate that. You can go much farther than just applying color, like you could use this to apply UVs later or do whatever you want, uh, but using this post-sim way of applying attributes saves so much time. Um, than like having to recache and re-render everything again. Um, you know, you can even just manipulate it as the sim is going to have a better idea of what these things are going to look like after they've been simmed. So then in comp, we can use that pass later. Um, here I'm just pulling that out. I'm adding a little bit of contrast. And then I'm just using an HSL tool to pull a key out of, that, um, out of that pass. And then I'll use it in a grade node later to, to uh, boost some of the highlights. You know, but you can really start to craft a look here without going in and like trying to place a light in this one specific spot. You know, whereas this is gonna follow the movement of all the tendrils and just look so nice. Um, here I'm just setting up another mask, and just as an example here, uh, why don't we just hue shift everything um, so we can actually see what we're doing? Um, so why not make the particles blue? Sure. But now everything's tracking with the sim, 
it's like we had this as an original render now. And um, yeah, it's just awesome for like being able to craft a look, even using this in design, you can get so far without having to go in and figure out the perfect place to place a light or, or whatever it is, you know, you can make a style frame in motion using a really simple mask like this. So then to get that, the bokeh particles that we were kind of talking about before, uh, whenever the spice is on screen, I just animated a noise kind of revolving in a similar way. Uh, I didn't think that this needed to really be in 3D. Um, it's such a simple effect that it doesn't really call for another render. Um, so I'm just crushing down that noise here and applying a convolve node with a bokeh shape to map the bokeh, uh, like the iris, onto the dots. Um, and they just have that same like flickering motion and then that just gets added back onto the render. Um, it's such a subtle thing that you don't notice that it's not all 3D anymore um, since they're just like shimmering and flickering. Um, but maybe taking some of these effects out of 3D but also not using stock footage uh, can be super helpful. So then on these last two shots, um, this is where kind of all of those techniques come together um, and just using like, mm, like procedural and comp to elevate some shots beyond like what was done in 3D. So what I'm doing here is taking a similar kind of noise and then the collision geo that Daniil made uh, that all the sand is running along and I'm projecting UVs from the position of the speaker so that we get this outwards flow from that point and then just animating that noise, uh, rushing away from it, color correcting it and then adding it back onto the render gives you this feeling of like another volumetric layer to the sand and just adding like additional detail on top. Um, you know, this is almost just free detail that we're getting without having to go into render getting someone who can do volumetrics and like get it to move exactly right. You know, this is just so much work for something so simple. Um, I'm all about taking shortcuts. <laughs> so kind of to wrap up these couple shots, um, you know, there's much more work that went into this project from everyone on, uh, you know, within the credits on the next slide but uh, you know, that we weren't able to get into here. But it was a colossal team effort from everyone involved and I'm like really super happy with how this project turned out. You know, some of these techniques aren't the most glamorous on the surface, but you know, when it combines with the input from the whole team, that's when it starts to add up together and become a great film. And that's my talk. I hope I shed some light on the, some of our thinking. <laughs> Thanks for coming out.